fun. Um, now, let me introduce today's historian is Professor Melissa Ziobro. And she is, has, she has served as the command historian at the U.S. Army Communications Electronics Command in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. She has pre, she previously served on the defunct Executive Council of Brookdale Community College Center, College's Center for World War II Studies and Conflict Re Resolution. And she currently serves on the Events Planning Committee for the World War II Era Studies Institute at the Info Age Science History Learning Center and Museum. And that is in Wall. You don't have to read that. Okay. <laughs> right now, what she does, you, you teach at Monmouth University. Yeah. Yes, yes. So um, she's come all the way from Tom's River. So without further ado, Professor Melissa Ziobro. Poor Eileen had my whole CV there. We would have been here. It would have eaten up all my time. I had to cut that off. Thank you so much for being here. It's a lovely turnout on a Sunday afternoon. Um, as Eileen mentioned, I did come all the way from Tom's River, but I do want to note that I'm especially happy to be here in Hoboken today because I have many fond memories of coming here to visit Grandma at 211 Adams Street. Um, our station wagon would usually overheat on the parkway. I did not have that problem today, so it was an even more pleasant drive than I had expected. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, again, I currently teach public history at Monmouth University. I teach the classes in museums and archives management, oral history, for our students who want to do history outside the classroom. But the basis of my presence here today is my previous life as the command historian for the Army Communications Electronics Command at Fort Monmouth. So we'll be talking a little today about Fort Monmouth in World War I. Okay? Now, there will be time for question and answers at the end, but I'm used to dealing with college students all day, so if you have a really burning question that cannot wait to the end, throw up a hand. You won't throw me off. I, I promise we can answer it instead of making you wait, okay? Let's briefly refresh our memories on the Great War before we hone in on Fort Monmouth, right? The Great War, ah, there we go, began in Europe when, over 100 years ago, uh, that would be up to Eileen. Eileen, can you dim the lights? I'm getting some requests here. Okay, there we go. I told you, if you've got problems, let me know. Can't throw me off. So the Great War begins in Europe over 100 years ago after a man by the name of Gavrilo Princip assassinates Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary on June 28, 1914. This event, and I'll, I have this script that's supposed to keep me from going off on tangents, but allow me one second to elaborate on this event. Um, when you look at the circumstances, right, the happenstance that kicks off this international disaster, it's really mind-boggling, right? He's traveling abroad. He has his wife with him. Normally, um, Sophie's not allowed to attend official engagements with him because she was seen as kind of low class. She was beneath him. So she happens to be with him, which is unusual. Um, there is an initial assassination attempt on his life, which is foiled, uh, but a policeman is injured. And so after that first unsuccessful attempt, he and his formal party are going to visit that policeman in the hospital. They make a wrong turn and turn right into the path of the assassin. Right? And so, against all odds, you know, the universe conspires to allow this to happen. And you know, it triggers a complex series of alliances such that uh, by the summer of 1914, country after country is declaring war on each other in Europe. Right? For anyone interested in the events surrounding the outbreak of war in the spring into summer of 1914, I really recommend this book called The Sleepwalkers. How Europe Went to War by Christopher Clark. I don't know, Mr. Clark. I'm not getting a commission. It's just a truly fabulous book. Um, suffice to say, though, by August of 1914, you've got millions of Europeans at war. Most thought it would be over quickly. People often do when there is a war. Unfortunately, of course, that would not be the case. So where does the United States stand in all of this as war is breaking out in 1914? You are not college freshmen, so I'm confident that you know that the United States was neutral. We're vehemently neutral, right? When World War War erupts, President Woodrow Wilson pledges neutrality for the United States. This is a position with which most Americans agree. We do know that we ultimately get into the war, right? Although the United States is ultimately involved in the war for just 19 months 
from April of 1917 to November of 1918, the mobilization of the country is extraordinary. Over 4 million Americans would ultimately serve in the armed forces, although of course only about 2 million make it overseas and about 1.4 million actually see combat. Uh, but about 4 million Americans serving in uniform in that short period of time. And the U.S. economy is going to churn out a vast supply of raw materials and munitions. So what then compels the United States to get involved in the war? One factor is simply that more Americans felt ties to Britain and France than to Germany and Austria. That is not to say that we did not have vibrant German, Austrian communities, I mean, you know, particularly in Hoboken, right? That, that was the case. But, but overall, the country feels this stronger allegiance to Britain and France. By 1917, it is becoming clear that Britain and France are nearing exhaustion. And so there's growing sentiment in the United States about helping our kins, right? Our, our traditional allies. The insistence of the United States on her trading rights was also very, very important. The world economy is highly globalized in 1914, and the United States resents disruptions to trade. The United States is an industrial superpower. It had been since the turn of the century. It's trading around the globe, and its position when war breaks out and these belligerent nations start trying to blockade each other is, well, we're neutral. We should be able to go about business as usual, right? Unfortunately, the belligerent nations are not of the same mind. And so the United States begins losing ships' lives, right, as they become entangled in primarily Germany and Britain attempting to blockade each other. Now, while the British and French used conventional surface vessels and blockading tactics to attempt to enforce its blockade of primarily Germany, what ultimately enrages American public opinion is the submarines used by Germany. The German Navy cannot compete with the British Navy. It cannot conduct a traditional blockade where it's going to board ships and take them into port and take the cargo and possibly reimburse the American companies. Germany is not equipped to do that. And so what they instead begin doing is sinking ships, sinking ships, right? And if one looks at the number of lives and, and the uh, sheer numerical value of merchandise lost. It's really quite astounding. Uh, and so in February of 1915, Germany uh, announces that it's going to have this policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. They show a map. Anything that comes in this zone is getting sunk. America, if you don't want your ship sunk, just stay out of this zone. It's that simple. America, again, does not feel that it needs to abide by those rules. And so the first submarine attack to really inflame public opinion, it is not the first submarine attack by any means, but it is the first to really inflame public popular opinion, is the sinking of the passenger liner, the Lusitania, in May of 1915. Lusitania leaves New York with a cargo of passengers and freight including what we will later find, hidden war goods, right? It should not be transporting war material on a passenger liner, but it is. The Germans go so far as to take out ads in newspapers telling people not to get on the Lusitania, that they believe it's carrying war material and that they will sink it if it enters the blockade zone, okay? People get on board nonetheless. Of the 1,959 passengers aboard the Lusitania, 1,198 were killed, including 128 Americans several of them um, from New Jersey. So as this makes the news, most Americans are outraged, but I thought this was so interesting. This is a clip from a Monmouth County newspaper, the Red Bank Register, and it talks about a local debate that they had um, publicly debating the international legality and morality of the Lusitania attack. And interestingly, this debate held in Atlantic Highlands ended in a draw. So what? that says um, about the people of the Atlantic Highlands. I'm, I'm not quite sure. We won't uh, expound on that. But for a time after the sinking of the Lusitania, the Germans see how enraged America has become. And they say, OK, whoa, whoa, whoa. We will back off this policy of unrestricted warfare. They do not want the United States to get into the war because they feel that that will make a decisive difference. And so for a time, they stop sinking American ships. This ends on January 31st, 1917, though. 
Why? Well, if you think of World War I, you often think of the stalemates of trench warfare, right? The war is dragging on and on, and the battlefront is changing very little. Both sides are dug in. Occasionally, one side gets up and tries to run across no man's land. They fall in a hell of machine gun fire. They regroup and they try again. Right? And so the war has become this horrific stalemate. The Germans feel a need to break it, and they think if they can cut off supplies from getting into Britain, perhaps that would help, that they can strangle them into submission. Three days later, the United States breaks diplomatic relations with Germany. This is not a declaration of war, but Wilson and other politicians are confident that now Germans are going to start sinking American ships en masse again, and that this will obviously be problematic. Then, in March of 1917, the text of the so-called Zimmerman Telegram is made public and published on the front pages of newspapers across America. This is a message from German Foreign Secretary Arthur Zimmerman to the German ambassador in Mexico. So he writes this note, and he basically says, listen, go to Mexico, try to get them to agree to be on our side. If they get into the war, if the United States gets into the war, and, and Mexico can tie them up on North America, they can keep them from coming over to Europe. We'll fund the Mexicans in their fight. We'll give them back all the land the Americans have stolen from them. It'll be great. Okay. Um, this note is intercepted and decoded by the British. And you have to imagine a little bit, the British were like, <laughs> right? Because now they intercept and they decode this note and they're like, Phew, finally, this has got to get the Americans. This is an utter provocation. It's got to get the Americans into the war on our side, right? And so President Wilson is advised of the note. He sees the German duplicity here. And he says, all right, let's make this public. He wants the American people to be on his side if he is going to ask for a declaration of war. And when he releases that Zimmerman note, public opinion firmly now swings in the direction of the United States entering the war. On April 2nd, 1917, Wilson goes before Congress to ask for the declaration of war. And within a few days, we have it. When the United States gets into the fight, it is still unclear who is going to win this war. It's not like we got in at the last minute, like looking to be on the winner's team. By no means is that the case. The fighting was marked by, as I said, trench warfare, long stalemates, massive casualties, just mind boggling casualties. But the large number of Americans available from there on out combined with the American industrial capacity will rapidly change the course of the war, right? And we know ultimately the armistice will come in November of 1917. There is no similar infusion of men, material, capital coming in on the German side. And so ultimately they have no choice. The four years of the Great War, as it was then known, saw unprecedented levels of carnage and destruction thanks to that grueling trench warfare and some of the um, modern technological innovations of warfare, such as, uh, for example, gas attacks, right? Uh, tanks, uh, early chemical weapons. By the time World War ends with the defeat of the Central Powers in November of 1918, more than 9 million soldiers had been killed and 21 million more wounded. The Treaty of Versailles, which is ultimately signed in 1919, determines post-war borders from Europe to the Middle East, establishes the League of Nations as an international peacekeeping organization, and punishes Germany harshly for its aggression. Tragically, it is often said that this conclusion, which is supposed to uh, put an end to war for all times, actually uh, sets us up for World War II in punishing Germany so harshly. So with that painfully brief overview of the war, right? I mean, I could spend an entire semester teaching World War I, but with that painfully brief recap, let's bring it back to New Jersey, right? Prior to the American entry into the war, New Jersey residents would have been impacted in a number of small ways. Of course, um, you know, there were some New Jerseyans killed aboard the Lusitania, for example. Um, there would have been appeals like this one you can see here to support citizens in war-torn Europe. There were some inflation caused by disruptions to our normal trading patterns. 
And then came the military, right? Here in Hoboken, you are all too familiar with the state's role as a major port of embarkation. I love, um, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to hear Mr. Joe Bilby from the National, Gar National Militia Museum of New Jersey talk, but they often show maps showing how many soldiers went from the United States to Europe, and they always have them leaving from New York. And Joe Bilby always says, it's not New York in most cases. Most of them actually left from Hoboken. Um, so you know all too well, right, that piece of New Jersey's World War I story. We also had military installations in New Jersey turning our citizens into soldiers. Camp Merritt, for example, Camp Dix, New Jersey's installations during the World War I period also include one that is very near and dear to my heart, Fort Monmouth, which will be the subject of our talk today. When the United States does get into World War I in 1917, it is fully recognized that our army of roughly 200,000 soldiers is not going to make a difference in the battles that lay ahead. And so we see ultimately a draft instituted rather quickly. We see an incredible mobilization. As I said, ultimately some 4 million in uniform. The Army's Signal Corps, that is the branch of the military charged with overseeing battlefield communications, was woefully small. We are talking about 55 officers and 1,500 men. That is nowhere near enough to secure communications for the enormous battlefields of Europe. And so the army was particularly preoccupied with setting up Signal Corps training camps, right? And so as the army began to search for land for Signal Corps training camps, their investigation led them to Monmouth County, New Jersey. Here we can see just some World War I Signal soldiers over in Europe. How are we gonna train these men? Well, what does the Monmouth Park racetrack have to do with it? Well, let me tell you. Um, so they send these search parties out across the United States looking for sites conducive to Signal Corps training camps. One of these parties stumbles across some land in Monmouth County where the old Monmouth Park racetrack and luxury hotel had been. If you are familiar with the Monmouth Park racetrack today, it's not that spot. It's the spot where Fort Monmouth was. This track had flourished during the latter half of the 19th century when some of Monmouth County's wealthier residents first brought horse racing to the area. Now, some of you may know, but during the Gilded Age, Monmouth County, the Jersey Shore, was like the place to vacation. I mean, talking about the Hamptons or places in California. No, they wanted to be in Monmouth County, right? President's vacation there. I mean, it was the place to go. People Magazine would have been all over these people. Um, Monmouth Park Racetrack, as we can see here, in these postcards was ultimately forced to close when a moralist movement in the New Jersey legislature outlawed gambling. They did not outlaw horse racing, but apparently nobody wants to go see horses run in circles if they can't bet on them. And so Monmouth Park Racetrack was abandoned. Uh, the beautiful hotel, which you see here, burns to the ground. The grandstand, which was reportedly the largest in the world at the time, comes down in a nor'easter in 1899. So the army comes across this plot of land, which had formerly been a racetrack and is now largely overgrown. There's some sharecropping being done at the site, but most of the plot is owned by a man by the name of Melvin Van Curen. Charles Corlett, who is the officer leading this expedition on behalf of the Army Signal Corps, recalled in a 1955 oral history interview that after examining several sites, he, quote, finally stumbled onto the old race course near Eatontown. I found part of the old steel grandstand with 11 railroad sidings behind it, the old two-mile straightaway track and two oval racetracks, all badly overgrown with weeds and underbrush. Upon inquiry, I learned that the land belonged to an old man who lived in Eatontown, who was very ill, on his deathbed, in fact. But when he learned my business, he was anxious to see me, end quote. Corlett learned that Van Curen had offered to give this land to the army free of charge during the Spanish-American War, but they weren't interested. And so Corlett says, okay, well, we'll take it for free now. And, and Van Curen's like, no, now you can buy it from me. So they have this little back and forth. He offers to sell the army the land 
for $75,000. They ultimately lease it on 16 May 1917 with an option to buy. The land includes about 468 acres, some of which was being used as a potato farm, but most of it is just overgrown and infested with poison ivy. So why this site? They're scouring the country. Why this site? Well, proximity to Hoboken was a major selling point for them. Proximity to the passenger terminal in Little Silver so they could get people to Hoboken. Good stone roads and access to water. And so the first 30 or so signal soldiers will arrive at Fort Monmouth, as it will eventually be known. Um, this map on this screen is a little hard for you to see, and I do apologize. We're looking at Middletown and Shrewsbury uh, in Monmouth County. The circle on this map shows you, as it was then called, Monmouth Park. And here we can see actual photos of the first Signal Corps soldiers arriving at Fort Monmouth. Um, we were fortunate uh, when I worked in the archive at Fort Monmouth. We had more photos than we knew what to do with because the Signal Corps held the Army's photography mission. And so we had plenty of photographers on hand to capture every mundane event that ever happened there. So here are some of the first soldiers arriving at the site. The installation was originally called Camp Little Silver, based on the town Little Silver that was right there. But locals refer to it all manner of ways. As you can see, if you look just at the headline here, they often called it Camp Monmouth Park because that's what they thought of the site as. General Orders, dated 17 June 1917, named this serious gentleman, Lieutenant Colonel Carl F. Hartman, the first commander of Fort Monmouth. And again, I apologize, some screens are bigger than others. If anyone is familiar with the area where Fort Monmouth is, this is Oceanport Avenue. This one works a little, little better when we're closer to home. Corporal Carl L. Whitehurst was among the first men to arrive at Fort Monmouth. He was not impressed. He's writing home and he writes how it is a, quote, jungle of weeds, poison ivy, briars, and underbrush. End quote. In fact, 129 soldiers are hospitalized for poison ivy exposure in July. Whitehurst writes home about remnants of the old Monmouth Park racetrack being everywhere, but only one building remains standing. And it's in that building that he and his comrades can kind of rotate in and out of if they need any shelter from the elements while they are awaiting the delivery of tents. And it was up at the top arrow, the old ticket booth from the Monmouth Park racetrack. Um, the top photo shows you the 1917, 1918 entrance to the site. The bottom aerial is a more recent one. And this is the racetrack ticket booth up close. You can see where it says 1890 on it. So railroads soon did bring those tents they were waiting for, as well as lumber with which to build barracks. Unfortunately, most of the lumber was green. According to Corporal Whitehurst, quote, by the time the wood was dried out, it was winter, and in December there were cracks you could put your finger through. The winter of 1917 to 1918 was a tough one, and sometimes the snow would pile up on your blankets coming through the gaps in the boards, end quote. Now, I must say, the first time I read that, I felt bad for Corporal Whitehurst, and then I thought, if somebody's in a trench in Europe, they would like to be in Monmouth County, New Jersey, with some snow on their blanket. So I don't know that I feel as bad for him as I initially did, but I digress. Uh, here you can see the tents on the top and a sample on the bottom of the temporary wooden construction that followed. The Army renamed Camp Little Silver Camp Alfred Vale in September of 1917 in honor of the New Jersey inventor who helped Samuel Morse develop commercial telegraphy. By the end of 1918, this was almost universally accepted as being the greatest Signal Corps camp ever established anywhere. And that's a quote. I'd like to show you just some samples of the facilities that are built here during the World War I period. We've got the mess hall. Here's the inside of the mess hall, nice and orderly. We've got the chefs hard at work on KP duty. The enlisted men's barracks, a bit spartan. The officer's quarters, which as you can imagine, are not quite as spartan. This is the interior of the officer's quarters. Here we've got the post library, the barber shop, looks like a fun place to hang out, the blacksmith, 
the post exchange, post office, the Western Union office, and we love those haircuts, right? <laughs> The Red Cross, I love the car, up front in the foreground, if you see that. The Knights of Columbus, where everybody is welcome. This is just a sample of some of the office space on site. The unassuming camp headquarters here. And I think photos of the facilities, you know, as we flip through them, they are illustrative of the growth that takes place there very quickly. Um, but as someone who's intimately familiar with the archive, what for me shows the vibrancy of the post are photos of the men who served there, right? So here they are training hard. This says breaking them in at Camp Alfred Vale. They played hard. In case you can't see, the music is over there. And they, they really formed relationships. Here they are um, doing a little wash by the side of Parker's Creek. And you know, as I looked at their faces over the years, I can't help but wonder you know, who, who left and didn't return. Right? We've got to keep in mind, you know, as we talk about these individuals in the abstract, many of them uh, would never get to return to the United States. Ultimately, the camp will prepare several battalions for war between August of 1917 and October of 1918. The American Expeditionary Forces in France will receive five telegraph battalions, two field signal battalions, one depot battalion, and an aero construction battalion from Camp Alfred Vale. What does that mean? What's the head count look like, right? To give you an example, the camp trains some 2,400 enlisted men and 440 officers for war in 1917, and some 1,000 officers and 9,000 enlisted men in 1918. Now, for those of you that are familiar with, say, Camp Merritt, right, these numbers don't compare to the thousands and thousands, tens of thousands that are moving through Camp Merritt, but these Signal Corps men were receiving highly specialized training, so it was, to a degree, a different kettle of fish. I should note, with all of these people living and working in such close quarters, the camp was hit particularly hard by the influenza outbreak that struck the nation in the fall of 1918. As outbreaks occurred, individual units were quarantined, and then ultimately the entire camp was quarantined. We ultimately have 267 men hospitalized and 11 deaths. This is really important. In addition to wartime training, right, turning these citizens into specialized Signal Corps soldiers, research and development work was done at Fort Monmouth from the very beginning. The Army wanted its own laboratories, completely independent of commercial laboratories like Bell Labs. Much of the labs research during this World War I period focused on wireless communications. You've got 43 temporary structures built to accommodate this mission, along with two airfields and four airplane hangars that are built to work on air-to-ground radio. Here you can see a shot of the Signal Corps Radio Laboratories, Camp Alfred Vale, 1919. Here's an interior shot. Here are some of the planes. Here we've got an interior of the airplane radio installation shop and an airplane repair facility. Two squadrons of the U.S. Army Air Corps, which is the predecessor to the modern Air Force, were assigned to Camp Alfred Vale in 1918. And the team at Camp Vail makes significant headway in adapting radio uh, to airplane communications. That air mission will ultimately be reassigned, reassigned from Camp Alfred Vail following the armistice and ultimately goes on to be the Army Air Corps uh, and then the Air Force. The, as we'll discuss in a minute, the people of Monmouth County were really welcoming to the soldiers of the base. The one thing they did not like was the air mission. There were letters written in complaints saying, you told us you were training troops, you did not tell us you were running an airport, and it's loud all hours of the day. And so that was kind of the one sticking point between the fort and its neighbors. Other than that, though, the men of Camp Alfred Vale formed many close associations with the Monmouth County community. Uh, this article here, if you just catch a, you know, look at the headlines of the articles I'm about to show, talks about how soldiers are putting on a vaudeville show as a token of appreciation for local women who had started a recreational facility for them. 
This is an article, and if you just look at the headline, it says, Soldier's Day, a novel Sunday experiment tried at Shrewsbury. It talks about a local pastor encouraging his congregation to adopt a soldier and take them home for Sunday dinner. And we find that even though there were a multitude of houses of worship on base, the men often preferred to go and worship in the local community. As you see here, it says, an open-air service was held by the Methodist Sunday night. It was largely attended many of those present being soldiers from the Signal Corps camp at Oceanport. And again here, I love this one. This talks about how local people wanted to make donations to the camp, right? The army had money to requisition what it needed, but the patriotic fervor that seized the people of Monmouth County led them to make donations, right? This one says, the Long Branch Lodge of Elks will give the Signal Corps at Monmouth Park a barrel of tobacco. Today, that would probably be a faux pas, but at the time, it was very well received, I assure you. Uh, here we see about two little girls collecting delicacies for soldiers at Monmouth Park. And this one makes me laugh especially because it talks about these little girls collecting watermelon and candy and driving their whole truckload of stuff over to the soldiers. And uh, my students at Monmouth University just coordinated a candy drive where we collected 700 pounds of candy to send to deployed military personnel. So, you know, some, some good deeds are timeless, right? The camp was also a boon for the local economy, creating jobs both on and off post. Here, we see a report of men taking up work at the base, and these types of notices were extremely common in the local newspapers. Harold here, he's given up his job at the Little Silver Station and gone to work at Camp Monmouth Park in the commissary, right? We see this again and again. And I'll give you a hint, the government was cheating. They were paying more than anybody off base could afford to pay, and so they were getting all the talented labor. What I love is that women, too, could find employment on the base. Here we hear about Miss Champenor giving up her position as a stenographer at the Boy Scout headquarters for a similar one at the Signal Corps camp. Again, because she was patriotic and could make more money. Um, here is a photo from the archive showing some of those local women at work in the offices. Now, in addition to creating jobs for civilians on base, the camp was a huge driver for the local economy off base. The soldiers had money to spend, as did the family and friends who flocked to see them. This article here talks about visitors filling a local village. Here, it is announced that three new businesses have opened in town thanks to the influx of visitors to Camp Alfred Vale. So there are countless newspaper articles like this in the Asbury Park Press and the Red Bank Register, but I'll read you just one more excerpt that I think really sums it up the best. Big money in this locality. More money is being spent for every purpose than ever before in the history of America. The United States government is spending several billions of dollars on war needs, Part of this money will flow into every community in the country. And it goes on to say, like, let's make sure we get our share. Okay? Um, and so it really it was this mutually beneficial relationship. Um, we're almost at the end of our prepared remarks, though. The war ends, right, thankfully, in November of 1918. There's no fresh infusion, uh, you know, of, of 4 million men in uniform, of supplies, of enormous industrial capacity coming in to save the Germans. Um, and so the war ends, and, and Fort Monmouth was supposed to end too. Camp Alfred Vale was supposed to end too. It was supposed to be temporary, but it winds up outliving the war. The chief signal officer authorizes the purchase of Camp Alfred Vale in 1919 for $115,000. The signal schools from around the country were consolidated at what will become Fort Monmouth that year in 1919. The installation receives permanent status and the name Fort Monmouth in 1925. So it becomes known informally as the home of the Signal Corps, formally as Fort Monmouth in honor of the soldiers of the American Revolution who fought and died at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse. So, as I said, Fort Monmouth from then on forward, you know, there's a whole nother story. We could go on for days and days and days because Fort Monmouth then is an active military installation from the end of World War II through 2011. 
serving uh, not just America's fighting men and women, but also um, innovating incredible technologies that had tremendous civilian applications, right? So the Signal School training the soldiers stays at Fort Mama through the Vietnam era, at which point it is moved down to Fort Gordon, Georgia, because we're just running out of space. There's this funny story told by a Signal soldier who he's supposed to be doing night maneuvers, getting ready to go to Vietnam, and so he's crawling along Route 35, and he can hear the music from the bars, and they're just like, this is not working, right? There wasn't room for the Signal School because Monmouth County was becoming um, so built up. And so the Signal School leaves. So that idea of training men to fight at Fort Monmouth leaves during the Vietnam era, but the research and development labs, which had been at Fort Monmouth from the beginning also, that's what really gains prominence from that period forward through the base closure in 2011. Some of the famous firsts that come out of Fort Monmouth are just mind-boggling. We're talking about um, the first communication satellite, Project SCORE, which broadcasts President Eisenhower's Christmas message to the world, um, early weather satellites and radars, um, early GPS and night vision technologies. We could go on and on. So things that not only um, gave the warfighter command and control of the battlefield, but also that wound up having incredible civilian applications. So Fort Monmouth was so wonderful. Why is it not there anymore? Well, um, the Army periodically does what is known as base realignment and closure, where they look at their international holdings and decide where they might close bases, combine bases, to try to save money. Um, Fort Monmouth had actually been on the list for closure several times, but it, it's finally, you know, gets the axe for good. In 2005, they mandate that they must move the major activities at Fort Monmouth to Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland, uh, by 2011. And so, you know, it, there's this transition period where people start to move down from 2005 to 2011, and the last flag lowering ceremony occurred there in 2011. So a lot of people say, well, if Fort Monmouth was so important, if they were innovating counter IED technologies to help in the global war on terror, how could they close it? Well, the closure of the base was no, um, it didn't have anything to do with the importance of the mission being conducted there. It was pick that mission up and move it somewhere because we think we can save some money by closing Fort Monmouth. <laughs> um, and so that's what happened. Now, I can say that as far as the Army is concerned, this history, this tradition continues. Uh, I, cho I resigned rather than move to Maryland because I do not leave the great state of New Jersey. Um, fortunately, you know, I landed on my feet. But, but that archive picked up and moved, and it is available down in Aberdeen Proving Ground for anyone who is interested. Uh, but I make the circuit here to try to ensure that this piece of history is not just Army history, it's New Jersey history, right? We should be proud of it, and we should get to claim some of it, too. And so that's why I'm here today. Okay, then Eileen, I will turn it back over to you.